Hi, I'm Frances Stewart. I'm one of the Education Committee co-chairs for Elders Climate Action. And we'd like to really welcome you uh, to this June national call. And we'll wait just a little bit longer for people to um, get in and get settled. Sure, there'll be a few more people filtering in, but let's go ahead and get started because we have some really exciting speakers for you this evening. Uh, we're gonna be talking about intergenerational climate action uh, with Hazel Chandler and Almeida Cooper from Moms Clean Air Force, uh, who will tell you more about themselves and more about what they do. So take it away. Okay. Well, I'm gonna share my screen and um, let me get this on slideshow. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, I've been a long time ECA, practically from the start, um, been on the National Coordinating Committee and, and worked on collaborations, um, uh, the Chair of Collaborations Committee for, for all of that time. And it's really, really a pleasure and an honor to be um, one of the presenters uh, for uh, a, an Elders Climate Action uh, call. Um, I'm here kind of holding two hats, uh, Elders Climate Action and uh, Moms Clean Air Force. And what we're going to be really talking about is, is uh, how we mobilize volunteers across generations to make real change. Um, I'm joined today with Almeda uh, Cooper, who is um, our manager of health equity for Moms Clean Air Force. And I serve in Arizona as a field organizer part-time uh, with Moms Clean Air Force and still do um, a lot of elders climate action work and actually uh, carry both hats in, in everything that I do. Um, let's, I, I, I know all of you are probably reeling with the events of the last couple of weeks. I don't know who all, saw the hearings today by the January 6th committee, but uh, for me, it was very concerning. And what it, it made me realize is how incredibly important it is for us to, uh, <clears throat> to come together, to work together, and to work across generations. Um, we must remember that uh, generations uh, there's much to learn as well as, uh, as what we can give. Um, we have the memory, us elders have the memory of, uh, of a time when our weather was more stable, where we didn't get 10, 15 inches of rain at the same time, uh, where we had a lot of old growth forests and all of those kinds of things, clear running streams. And we can bring that to the table, but our kids have the imagination and the ideas and the vision for making change. And, um, and all of the generations in between are also incredibly important. I want to remind you, it only takes one person to mobilize a community and inspire change. <clears throat> Even if you don't feel like uh, you have it in you, it is in you. you. You have to believe in yourself. And when you start to reach out to people in your community, uh, uh, people will see your vision and your passion and follow you. So I'm going to um, talk to you about what I've done in my work and what Mom's uh, Clean Air Force has done in, um, in, in doing just that. Um, I believe that building partnerships is a key to changing policy at all levels. Uh, we used to have nonprofits spend a lot of time uh, trying to protect their ground. And they were afraid that if they, if they partnered with other groups, they would um, not, have, not get the funding and so on. And we're seeing just absolutely the opposite happening now. We realize that we have to develop partnerships with a broad spectrum of organizations. It is incredibly important that that is intergenerational, multicultural, and interfaith. Yeah. 
um, because that's the key to getting important work done and the key to work to the solutions. Um, it's essential that we communicate what's going on across our state and also with other states. And we must uh, raise the dialogue about, about political divide. Um, we're going to be talking, uh, you know, I've been talking about mobilizing across gender. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot to turn it off. Um, it, I will be talking about a project that we did here in Arizona, Faces of Climate Action Town Hall, a little bit about the play-ins that we did with Moms Clean Air Force in DC, and hopefully that'll happen again soon. Um, and, a, and a very powerful Arizona Climate Action Coalition that Elders Climate Action takes the lead on. And then we'll turn it over to our rock star, Almeida, to talk about Moms Clean Air Force work and especially our uh, our clean school bus program, which is is one of these great things that you can actually do uh, to get started in building intergenerational um, uh, contacts in your community. And we'll tell you more about that later. Um, in 2019, in the spring of 2019, we got a, a an opportunity to apply for a grant from the Environmental Defense Fund, their Summer of Action grant. And uh, we, we got the grant to do five phases of climate action town halls across Arizona. This, for me, was probably one of the bigger jobs that I've taken on because we had um, about a little less than two months, about a month and a half to get five um, <laughs> climate action town halls uh, organized in Arizona. And I probably would have never, ever got it done without Jen um, because she did an incredible job of helping me coordinate that. Uh, we conducted town halls in Tucson and Flagstaff and three in Phoenix. And I had pretty good contacts here in Phoenix with other climate related and and youth and minor minority and even elected officials. But basically, I didn't have many contacts at all in Flagstaff and, and Tucson. And just reaching out and, and you know making a list of potential partners and then just starting to, to make phone calls to people and say, I need to find such and such in the Flagstaff area. Who, who is doing, who's with Citizens Climate Lobby, who's with Sierra Club, who's with uh, the youth, youth, youth strike, uh, climate uh, strike people. Um, we were able to pull together a really active group of probably a dozen or more organizations that in those local communities that helped us develop at those town halls. They turned out fabulous. We had wonderful attendance. Um, we had a couple hiccups. Uh, our Phoenix one got canceled at the very last minute, like an hour before it was, or a couple hours before it was to start because they had a power outage in the library that we were having and it was 100 degrees in the place. Um, and we then had to move the... Uh, the Tucson one, we had to move a couple different times and we had to get an extension to do that one. But actually, and it worked out great. It, it turned out to be the same weekend as the, as the youth strike uh, activities that were going on. And so we made the decision on that one to do a little different format. We turned it over to the kids to plan and to carry out. And I have to tell you, the the town halls we did, the four town halls we did were great. And we had great speakers from the city, county, uh, elected officials from state, county, city, um, as well as scientists and, and professors from our colleges that talked on climate. And it was really great. But the one in Tucson was the one that was up. I just, it was an e easy format to put together and it was amazing. We had a panel of kids. If, if you look over here, right here, uh, 
Oops. Oops. Oh, I just screw myself up. Jen, do you know how I go back? You should be able to use your back arrows and go backwards. Um, I don't. The back arrows on your keyboard. Or you might want to X, there you go. Okay, okay. So these kids right here are, um, are the kids that did the, the Tucson one. This is another view of them. We had Ralgar Hall, Senator, uh, Representative Ralgar Halva, who represents that area. And we also had uh, city county um, uh, people represented. So we had, um, I believe four elected officials and, and this group of um, amazing kids from Chris, who is here in the white shirt that was 14 years old. And um, these kids put together a list of questions to ask our elected officials. And at, at times, I think the discussion was just amazing. And at times, I think we were wondered who were the real experts because some of these kids came up with things and, and comments to what the elected officials did that was just beyond brilliant. So I just, you know, I, I highly recommend you, if you're interested, this is something you can easily put together in your community. We partnered with, um, the University of Arizona. We got a free building with the University of Arizona. Um, it was in their School of Sustainability. It was a beautiful auditorium. Uh, as you can see, we had state-of-the-art um, um, equipment, and it was just great. And this is something you can do in your community. You just have to make a few phone calls. And if you want help, um, you know, you can, you're welcome to contact me. I'm Hazel C at eldersclimateaction.org. Um, I will help you if, I, if, you're, if you're interested in doing it and provide you with some of the materials we have. So I wanna move on. Another amazing cross-generational, cross-cultural um, activity that I was part of was in 2019 was Moms Clean Air Force and Elders Climate Action. Uh, sponsored a play-in in DC. This was fabulous. Um, we flew in um, and stayed at a hotel. I can't remember what the hotel is. You get part of the bat lever, the name, but not the full name. Um, we had um, training and uh, informational sessions the first day. And then the next morning, um, we all gathered out front. This was us gathering uh, to begin our march to the park for the play-in. Um, as you can see, there's all ages. Unfortunately, this picture doesn't have a lot of green shirts, but we had a number of green shirts there as well. Um, and uh, we marched uh, about a mile um, to the park with uh, a band. Uh, you can see a little bit of the drum band uh, that we marched with right here in this picture. Um, we had several, a couple, well, I think two, three or four hours in the park with all kinds of activities, um, including parachutes, including acting out some environmental plays with the kids. Um, we had kids making art kinds of things. Um, most of the kids were Moms Clean Air Force uh, t-shirts, which are absolutely beautiful. Uh, we had uh, we also had pictures taken in front of the of the Capitol as well. Um, we had speakers, including several of our our Congress and senators as well as moms and other uh, interested people. Uh, unfortunately, by that time, it was starting to rain. So you notice the umbrella, kind of the little bit of darkness, but we had a good weather earlier in the day. This is the kids. One of the entertainment was, was getting um, um, 
songs and and uh, entertainment that got the kids moving and talk uh, clapping and so on. And so this is a really great, great picture of of the kids. Um, and this is some of our green shirts uh, since we didn't get in a lot of the other pictures. And again, Jen was taking the pictures, so she isn't showing up in in these pictures, but she was very much there. Um, then we spent uh, some time meeting with our elected officials in our states. This is the delegation from Arizona, uh, with the exception of Jen, who was taking the picture. Uh, Jen and I were there from Arizona. Uh, we had several families, um, mostly Spanish speaking uh, families, so we were we were doing bilingual meetings as well. Our youngest was uh, Columbus Saints, who is Monsclean Air Force organizer in Arizona um, th that I work closely with. Uh, her baby, who was six months old. And as you can see, this is our uh, congressperson, uh, Ruben Gallego. And Ruben, the minute we walked in the room, reached out and started holding the baby. So that was really exciting. Ruben is is next to me. I, I have red hair in this. So I, I quit coloring my hair. But um, we had um, three little girls as well. And uh, Columbus little girl, we were in Ann Kirkpatrick's office uh, for the meeting, and while we were all talking, when we were talking about a really serious subject, uh, her little girl went and climbed in Ann Kirkpatrick's chair and was sitting there like she was the, the congressperson, and it was so funny. She was like three and a half, maybe four years old at the time. Um, so that was a great uh, opportunity. Um, then out of the um, work that we did on the faces of climate action in summer of 2020 here in Arizona, we were struggling with COVID and with everything that was going on. And so we, we wanted to find a way to keep our elders climate action work going. We were having trouble getting meetings organized, finding places and then with COVID that just shut that down completely. Um, we decided to build on the, all of these partnerships that we already established from the um, <clears throat> faces of climate action and, begin, and build a first stand for fair elections a coalition that then morphed into the Arizona Climate Action Coalition. This is just part of the, of the groups that have been involved. We focus on intergenerational, interfaith and multicultural co um, collaboration. We coordinate strategies um, for influencing our state, federal, local, county, um, legislature, these uh, we meet every Friday and uh, we discuss, you know, what's going on in various parts of the state and what are the important things that we need to do that week. We mobilize members to, to make calls, write letters, attend protests. Um, we've partnered with a lot of groups on sign on letters and public testimony um, and policy work groups. Um, just as a side note, since the first of the year, the coalition in, in collaboration with Moms Clean Air Force and um, some of our other partners have actually started writing our own sign-on letters. And we've done, I think, six or seven, um, a couple, I think three that went to our senators. Um, we had some amazing results. Um, the, the latest one we did to our senator, we got 220 individual signatures plus over 30 organizations that signed on to that letter. And we heard back from <clears throat> Senator Kelly and he was very impressed that um, with the letter and the quality of the letter and, uh, and, and how, how many people we were able to mobilize. 
On another one, we mobilized 110 people in 24 hours, plus 35 organizations to sign on to a letter for the Corporation Commission. So, you know, this is becoming a really powerful uh, partnership of, of people. Um, I want to, I, I'm, I think I'm going longer than I wanted to go, but just some of the other things we've done is, you know, Environmental Day at the legislature, partnering with our youth and the youth climate strikes, a lot of work with federal advocacy, both the EPA and legislature, advocacy with the Corporation Commission. Plus, we've worked really extensively on climate action plans and climate emergency declarations uh, all across our state. And one of the beauties of bringing people to the table via Zoom from across the state that are from a bunch of different groups is we have so much knowledge we can share and ideas that we can share. And um, you know, the work we were doing with City of Phoenix on their climate action plan, which has been done and passed, um, has, has informed the work in other areas like the Sedona action plan. Um, our, the City of Phoenix action plan was taken to Sedona to, uh, to the, the staff at Sedona as, as examples of what could be in that. And I even have to report that Prescott, who has been a huge holdout, is now working on a climate action plan. And this is just a few pictures of, um, of the youth strikes that we participated in. And um, we also, we talked about intergenerational um, lobbying at the federal level, but this is, this is an environmental day at the state legislature. And again, we had a cross-generational group there. This is in my um, <clears throat> legislative district. This is our team uh, from 2019. Um, and as you can see, we even had a baby. <laughs> so uh, it, it's really great. What I find is when we have those cross-generational, we are listened to. We even got into uh, to talk to a couple of our uh, a representative and a senator that usually don't meet with our group. And I think the fact that the, uh, um, the people that outreached uh, to um, those, that senator and that representative uh, were these two beautiful young ladies here that were juniors in high school and they made our appointments. And I think that's why we, we got appointments because in years before that, um, they wouldn't meet with us. So uh, that was really exciting. So anyway, now I would like to talk about what can we do right now and what is going on with Moms Clean Air Force that we have opportunities to partner with. And I want to introduce to you our, our rock star, our superstar, um, Almeda Cooper, she is uh, just an amazing lady, and she's our, our um, expert on the clean um, school buses, electric school bus program. Um, she was on today's show in, in April, and uh, it's really exciting to see um, our group, you know, even had to take today's show dealing with this, these kind of subjects, because that wouldn't have happened four or five years ago. It's only through all the work all of you are doing that we finally got to the place where, um, where people were willing or were, were being reached out to by, by the national media. So, Almeida, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, I don't have any slides, so we can um, just be on the. Uh... If I can find find the place, so, or, or, or not. Um, oh yeah, before we before this is a good transition. Uh, that slide that uh, Hazel just showed, 
Um, and I know you're going to have, the audience is going to have access to her slides. It's really uh, wonderful to see how many different states that Momskin Air Force is active in. And it's an easy way for our, the members of this audience to be able to partner with Momskin Air Force. So when you have access to the slides, please do look at that list of states where Moms has field coordinators such as Hazel and uh, please feel free to reach out to them. You can also just go to our main website, momscleanairforce.org, and the list of states is also there. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Hazel, for that uh, introduction. And I wanted to say that I am the one who is thrilled to be here with Hazel because she is very amazing and has been an amazing spokesperson and also just by introducing me to this organization, I, I told, just before we started the call, I said, I feel like I found my people because the um, principles that you adopt in terms of intergenerational, multicultural and interfaith are exactly the areas of work that I focus on as the national manager for health equity for Moms Clean Air Force. So uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I thought it might be helpful for me to just say to the audience why I'm here and how I got here in terms of doing environmental justice work. Like many of the people who are in the audience, uh, before I started doing environmental justice work, I did have a first chapter for the last 30 years of my professional career. I was a general counsel in healthcare organizations, hospitals, associations, universities, medical schools. And so my background is in health. And so it was kind of a natural, and, and because of my interest in health and the connection between health and climate is so strong, um, it was a natural uh, transition for me to become involved first with Moms Clean Air Force, where I was the state coordinator in Georgia. And now I'm with the, uh, at the national level, I'm a full-time uh, worker with Moms Clean Air Force, which, by the way, is a part of the Environmental Defense Fund, which I heard, Hazel, I heard you mention that one of the uh, grants that you received was very instrumental in some of the work that you've been doing here in Arizona. So that's also really important. And also in terms of, again, I think so much of what we do in environmental justice is elevating our personal stories and making what we do accessible, particularly to elected officials and school boards and county commissioners, so that they can understand that climate action and the impact of climate affects real people. And so that's why I'm gonna take just a maybe longer than I ordinarily would to talk a little bit about my personal story. So my parents, we're both social workers, which kind of informs my whole life of really being committed to community action and caring about my fellow human beings, whether as a healthcare lawyer or in the civic uh, activities that I've been involved in and now as a part of Moms Clean Air Force. Um, my... Um, my real, when I started Moms Clean Air Force, I started in the pandemic. So I've never had the opportunity, although I've heard so much about the play-ins that mom has in, in the past and bringing people together. But even though we have been mainly on Zoom for these last two years, uh, we have been able to focus on what we think is important. And that is, using our personal stories to change minds and to promote action. And again, going it's just uh, amazing that we're able to do that on an intergenerational basis because it is powerful when elected officials see the range of people and our ability to um, have collaboration on the issues that are important to us. Um, so when I began, well, when I began working at the national level and became the national manager for health equity, I have uh, this year been working on multiple panels to address different issues in health equity. So the first uh, panel that we did earlier in the summer or in the spring was um, health equity and inequity, what must be done for our children in Georgia. 
And the second panel that we did was in a really kind of focused in the Midwest. I collaborated with one of our Momskin Air Force state coordinators, Tracy Sabata, and we focused on maternal health and had a panel that included Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, who I'm sure might be familiar to many in the audience because she's the head of the Congressional Black Caucus and she's often a very visible member of Congress on a variety of issues. Um, and she's a climate champion. She's been one of Moms Clean Air Force's climate champions. And also we had a state representative and again, that's an emphasis into what Hazel was saying is that when you can bring people at all levels of elected officials and make them aware of what we're doing, it's uh, it's very, very effective. Um, and it, also on that panel, we had a, a mom to tell her personal story about her daughter, who's a scholar athlete who, um, who has uh, asthma. And asthma is the number one chronic disease of all children in the United States and also impacts children who have to ride school buses. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, after that panel, we just had a panel uh, on indigenous and tribal communities and the impact of health equity and inequity, clean air and climate. Again, I learned so much being the moderator of that panel. Again, we had a very strong panel that included a physician, a mom, and a healthcare provider who had spent um, several decades working uh, with indigenous and tribal communities. And we're going to have a new, another panel coming up quite soon in July, where we're going to be focusing on extreme heat and its impact in the Latina community on moms and children, and particularly on outdoor workers. So Again, in my work uh, at Momskin Air Force, those are all kind of issues that are important, here, not only uh, nationally, but also uh, in Arizona as well, I feel. Um, I want to, um, uh, uh, oh, one other area that I have wor I work on is with interfaith issues because uh, the importance of so many uh, women uh, who have strong belief, faith, base beliefs and uh, moms is collaborating with uh, an, a couple of national organizations, including the Environmental Defense Fund. And we are going to be later in the summer uh, reaching out to our congressional representatives based on some discussions that we've had with women of faith and women of color. And again, tying that to the impact on climate, because we know that there's such a disproportionate impact on environmental impacts on the on, on, on communities so on brown and black communities and I understand that your call next month you're going to be talking about the president's uh, justice 40 initiative which is a reflection of that disproportionate impact on these communities um, so one of the other areas that I have uh, and which has started off with talking about is electric school buses and I know that there's some people saying, you know, that sounds great, electric school buses, but you know, we have a lot of other issues and how does that really relate? And one of the, uh, the, one of the benefits of what we do, Elders Climate Action and Moms Clean Air Force, is that we help people to understand why are these issues important and why do we need to be involved? So, Electric school buses and are, are important because there are over 470,000 buses in the United States and over 25 million children when school is in session are riding buses at least twice a day, if not to their sports activities and lots of other activities and they're riding on electric school, bu they're riding on diesel powered fuel uh, school buses. And when I think of my own personal example, I think of my daughter many years ago and the first day that she got on that big yellow iconic school bus. And, you know, I guess because I was a lawyer, I was a little obsessive as a mother. So I had put a little name badge with her name on it, her 
teacher's name on it. So she would, if she got lost, somebody would know, you know, what's where she's supposed to be. But she was so excited and I was excited. She got on that school bus and the doors closed. I was happy. It was a, you know, little tear in the eye. I had no idea that I was putting my daughter on a bus that could be a danger to her and her friends because tailpipe emissions from diesel fuel powered buses are a proven carcinogen. That can be good for any child. And then when you combine that with the fact of how long school buses idle, either at while they're waiting and in the schoolyard and then you have all the other parents who are in their cars idling and all of that tailpipe <laughs> exhaustion is coming into the air of our children, our teachers and our tr bus drivers and the parents and you know the younger sisters and brothers or whomever is in the car uh, with them while they wait or on the school bus. And for those of you who have grandchildren or you may have uh, children who have asthma, when there are bad air days, those are days when children with asthma are not even supposed to get on a diesel fuel uh, school bus. That's horrible. It's just, it, there's, when we know that clean energy alternatives exist, there's no reason that we should allow that to happen. And um, there are, so one of the things that we have found is that if we can get information to parents and to transportation directors in school districts, to school boards, elected officials, then we can begin to see a change. And one of the most exciting things that is existing right now is that there is the clean uh, school bus program that Hazel mentioned earlier. And uh, there is um, $500 million to fund that program and to help priority school districts to be able to uh, be able to acquire electric school buses. Now, the thing that is so amazing and in the toolkit that is attached to the materials that you are going to be, you and the audience are going to be able to access, it has a link to the uh, application. It has a sample letter that you can write to your officials. Um, so, you know, that again, that makes it's very easy. You don't have to spend a lot of effort trying to figure out what to say or what this is all about. But the fantastic thing about this program is that uh, this the, it's a multi-year program. This year, the program, you can submit an application until August 19th. The program is actually administered by the Environmental Protection Agency but they've made it very, very simple. It's a one page application. So one of the things is that, you know, it's kind of daunting when people hear money from the government, it's gonna be some kind of complicated uh, program and how will we ever do that? That is not the case with this particular program. They have tried to make it as simple as possible. The other thing that's really important to know is that the program is called a rebate program, but to the credit of the EPA, they have structured it so that a school district will be able to receive the money before they have to pay for the school bus. So even though it's called a rebate program, which would make you think that, oh, we've got to upfront the money and then the most vulnerable communities that have the least resources might not be able to, to purchase a school bus under this program, that is not the case. So that is a, a really wonderful uh, part of the program. Um, the, the, elect, the clean school bus program does also provide uh, monies that can be used to um, acquire propane buses. And in the spirit of transparency, I will say that that, that, that that is also an opportunity. But at Moms Clean Air Force, and I think any organization that's really thinking about we have a better alternative. Even though propane is one step up from diesel powered, uh, it's still, there's still you know, emissions and it's, it's not as good as electric school buses for our children. 
And there is in the uh, materials that's part of what the EPA has made available. And again, you can be able to link to this from the materials that are gonna be provided with the program today. Uh, they have a Q and A. And I want to uh, just go through some of the questions and answers. And I'm doing this because uh, my years of experience of knowing most people do not want to go through 14 pages of questions <laughs> to try to find out what the answers are. So I have done the hard work for you and I want to just share with you some of the highlights that are in those questions um, some of the, and some of the questions that are answered. Um, I mentioned to you that it's called a rebate program, but it's not actually a rebate program. They're, you're going to be able to get the money in your school district um, probably before you have to pay for the bus. And the money is the source of the money is the bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed last year that provides for $5 billion uh, for the clean school bus program to replace ex existing school buses with clean and zero emission school buses. So that's amazing. And um, for each fiscal year between 2022 and 2026, there's $500 million available for the zero emission buses. Now in my state of Georgia, um, if every amount of money that could be allocated to the state of Georgia, it would result in $50 million being available to school districts in Georgia to purchase clean energy school buses. I don't know what it is, you know, in every state, but that's how much it is in Georgia. And I'm imagining that it's, you know, that it's similar in other states. So again, in the materials that we provided, there's a list of the priority districts. And you can just click on that link and you can look and see where the priority districts are in your state. Um, so, so that, so that's the, that's the total amount of monies that are available. Um, so what, what's the next? Well, the, uh, the funds are available to just about every school district and a school district can work with a contractor because, you know, in some in some school districts, the school district doesn't own the buses. And so they have to collaborate with a vendor who does provide the buses, but there is a mechanism for doing that. So again, they no school district should say, oh, well, you know, what does it, difference does it make to us? We don't own our school buses. There's an opportunity for you to work with, um, work with this, with the vendors who do provide school buses. Um, what districts are prioritized? Uh, high need school districts and low income areas are in the priority list. Again, that list is available in the materials that you're being provided today. Um, and, that, and that's really important to know. Um, how are school buses defined? <laughs> now, you know, when I thought of this, I was like, what, how do, why do you have to define a school bus? But a school bus, is a passenger motor vehicle designed to carry a driver and more than 10 passengers that the Secretary of Transportation decides is likely to be used significantly to transport pre-primary, primary and secondary school students to and from school or an event related to school. So I apparently, which I didn't know this until I read all these Q&As, that, you know, it won't apply to those vans that, you know, that some school districts may have. It's going to apply, it's intended to apply to what we might think of as a traditional school bus, a bus that carries 10 or more passengers. The other thing uh, that I think some people have had questions about is how many buses can we get? Well, apparently a school district can get up to 25 school buses on this plan. Now, some people have been a little bit concerned about the fact that they have to um, replace school buses 
or, or, or get rid of school buses. So the idea is that the government wants you to use clean energy school buses and not keep those old diesel <laughs> fuel buses, uh, you know, for use or as backup or whatever. So you will, the school district does have to find a way to um, discard those old buses. And um, the amount of money that you can get for each school bus is from $15,000 to $375,000. So that is going to cover pretty much the cost of most uh, clean energy uh, school buses. Um, and uh, the, again, the deadline for submitting is a hard and fast August 19th, 2022 because they want to get the money dispersed within 60 days and to be able to get the program rolling as quickly as possible. If for some reason the school district does not participate this year, again, remember this is a multi-year program and there will be an opportunity next year, but don't wait. Get involved, get your school district to make sure they have their application in this year. And um, as I said, the applicants are going to be notified within 60 days of the submission of the completed uh, application process, which will be after August 19th. Again, that's the hard and fast date. And as I told you, they have to scrap those old school buses. So those are probably, when I was going through those pages and pages of questions and answers, I thought those were some of the questions and answers that you may come up if you go to a school board uh, meeting um, and or you have someone who is uh, asking questions about how does this impact? And the other thing is, is that some, because it's summer, that was a concern that many people had. It's like, oh my goodness, it's summer. Like, how will they know? Well, actually, uh, during the summer, there are administrators who are working on grants for uh, their school districts. And so they are actually around during the summer. And uh, you can also reach out to vendors that you know who are in your district. In our state of Georgia, we happen to have a, a, a provider, a vendor that makes electric school bus buses, Bluebird. And Bluebird is offering um, webinars to school districts and to transportation directors who want to find out more about the program. And I'm sure that there are other kinds of, uh, of uh, either consultants or bus manufacturers that have similar programs. And certainly you could contact Bluebird in um, their online, easy to find uh, if you want to find out more about these types of programs. So there's lots of resources, lots of energy, and I just uh, was on a call recently with a, a mom's clean air force uh, coordinator from the state of Pennsylvania. And she was giving the example to say that in an informational session, like what we're doing right now, they made information to their school district and the school board members were not aware of the program or they only had just a little bit of information once uh, Vanessa Lynch and her colleagues made that information available. Then the school board did reach out to their vendor and they are now applying for um, applying to be a part of this program. So that's a real life example of where an organization, in this case, Moms Clean Air Force, but also it could have been Elders for Climate Action, making information available so that some of these myths or lack of knowledge would not be a barrier to participating. And I just can't say how imp enough, how important it is to think about why leave any money on the table? I mean, there's going to be $500 million to get clean energy school buses. We need to be involved with that and we need to let our school district folks know. And um, I get excited about these issues. So I apologize because I think I've probably spoken longer than I should have. And I know we want to leave time for questions and answers. And um, if for any reason uh, we don't get a chance to answer all the questions you need answered uh, while we're on this session. Um, Hazel and Jen 
uh, have my contact information and I'm happy to help anyone who has a question. So uh, with that, I, I think uh, Francis probably wants to get onto the Q&A. I would love to hear you talk longer, but we we only have a little bit of time, so we'll go with the Q and A and get as many of those questions done as as we can. But that was that was fabulous. So one question for Hazel is: um, Do you all work with the Climate Reality Project and the and the Climate Reality Project chapters around the country? Yeah, we do absolutely. Um, here in Arizona, we have, I think four climate reality chapters right now that are all part of our coalition. So we work very closely with them and we coordinate on activities. Um, yeah, I, I also think that there is um, a question that came that was in there about climate action now. Mm -hmm. We also, not through Moms Clean Air Force, but through the coalition, we work very heavily with climate action now actions. And they were asking about, um, you know, that versus sign on letters. I say both, you know, some of the same things we put in sign on letters, we did a climate action now um, um, action on, on a similar kinds of thing. You know, we changed it a little bit. Um, so we got, we got the action from, from two different directions. And I think that's really positive. That's great. And for anybody who's not familiar with Climate Action Now, it's an app for um, iPhone and iPad and uh, Android uh, to make it really easy to uh, do a whole variety of climate actions. We can, if anybody has questions about that, we can talk about it more later. Um, but uh, Almeda, why would any school board not go with uh, electric buses? Why would they buy new diesel buses? <laughs> It's so frustrating. So in my in Fulton County, uh, which has 78,000 school children, the transportation director has anxiety over whether or not an electric school bus would be able to um, go the length of the district. So it's a 90 mile, it's Atlanta, it's Fulton County is very large. So it's a 90 mile stretch. So he's worried. And then he also has some fears that cold weather might be a problem. Um, we have talked to him, we have tried to persuade him, uh, but he has not been persuaded yet. So some of those are some of the things that we hear. The other thing is, is that there's a belief uh, well, there's not a belief. It's true that in addition to the bus, you also have to make sure that you have appropriate infrastructure. And uh, some school districts have not done the research or they're, they're just afraid. And I think it's more a lack of knowledge uh, than anything else. Uh, but, but the main reason they give is they, they believe that it's going to be too expensive. And we try to persuade them that our children's health is worth it. Now, yeah. along that line, um, we have Cartwright District that, in Arizona, and there has been some concerns uh, from people in Arizona that, you know, it's too hot for school buses. Um, you know, we, we did a photo shoot at a Cartwright School District a, a few weeks ago um for a, a letter for an article that's coming out in USA today shortly and um we we talked with their transportation director and I asked him how he liked the, their new school bus and he said well if I had every single one of these buses right here as a clean school bus I would be absolutely in hog heaven. He said, I can, I can go by this school bus and not choke to death. And when the rest of the school buses are taking off, they're I'm choking to death. So, you know, he is definitely, they're definitely applying and they're very excited about the opportunity to apply and get more school buses, um, more electric school buses. It's it it's amazing. It makes no sound. It's you know. There's no. Um, I've always had to take an inhaler if I'm going near school buses because I start with an asthma attack, and uh, and I've been at schools when kids are boarding those buses and and they have to have inhalers and 
you know, with these clean school buses, that's not an issue at all. And they can run the air conditioning when, whenever it doesn't cause any problems for the bus at all. We've had several questions about, you know, the cost of these buses and, you know, what's the total cost of ownership over the years and the, with the operating costs over time. And I'm going to could you tell us a little bit more about that. Yes. So I am not an expert, but this is what I have been told that over time when they've done, you know, cost effective studies, the electric school bus will be cheaper. Now they, the buses are expensive, but actually all buses are expensive. <laughs> so, I mean, you don't realize it because I mean, we've never talked about like, oh, the bus costs, you know, $300,000 because you're thinking, oh, it's just an electric, I mean, it's just a yellow school bus. How much could it cost? But the buses are expensive, but over, but over time, based on the studies that have been done, the electric school bus will be cheaper. Great. Um, now, one of the things that schools have to do or school districts have to do moving to electric buses is charging infrastructure. Will the funding for the federal government pay for that? Yes, there's separate funding for the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So there, it's, I think on a, a full school bus, it's something like $25,000 for, the, for the, the charging infrastructure. Um, the, the one thing that they do need to deal with is reaching out to their utilities and make sure that there's uh, adequate utility power uh, coming into that to that area. Um, here in Arizona, we have a number of schools that have solar panels on their parking lots. And so, you know, covering the areas where um, the electric school buses are with, with solar panels, maybe even take care of the electricity. And uh, what Almeida said uh, about the the cost, I just watched a video the other day, I think it was put out by Bluebird or one of the school bus manufacturers, but they were talking about the overall cost and the, you know, the definitely in the life of the school bus, it's, it's cheaper to go electric than it is gas or diesel. In Virginia and some other places, they're partnering with electric utilities and actually using the buses as batteries because they sit yeah. empty most of the time. They only run right. when they need to move kids yeah. back and forth. Um, so that the, um, the electric utility is actually paying a good portion of the cost and then using them as batteries when they're not needed uh, for kids. So there are lots of creative things being uh, done with all this. And uh, if we had the, had the time, I'm sure we could, we could talk for a really long time about this, but I really appreciate um, you all here and I appreciate Ahmed um, being willing to um, answer more questions later. And tomorrow, everybody will get a link to the video and to the toolkit. Um, that will help you, uh, you know, work with uh, your own local school districts if that's something that you uh, are interested in doing. And just wanted also to give you all a heads up about things that are coming. Uh, next month for the national call, we've got uh, Rachel Patterson from Evergreen Action talking about Justice 40, uh, which should be a, a fascinating uh, look at what the Biden administration is doing to uh, really improve environmental justice across the United States. And also we have a, a special event on July 20th. Um, we're gonna have a panel, let's talk about environmental justice uh, that we'll be doing in collaboration uh, with the People's Justice Council and Alabama Interfaith Power and Light. So we hope we'll see you both for uh, all of these events. And Almeda, you definitely are one of our people. We hope we will see more of you. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank Good you. Good night. Thank you.